So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Bialik, if he needs an introduction. Bill is widely recognized for his agenda setting contributions to theoretical physics of biological systems. These include um, um, you know, influential streams of work on neural coding. Also has a book, co-authored the book Spikes. Uh, information in information theory, he has made uh, a pivotal contribution. He's one of the co-inventors of the information bottleneck method to quantify relevance of data. If I understand correctly. Um, high quality feminology of experiments. Uh, you know, I, I think when I first met Bill, I uh, remember reading his papers on flies. In, in fact, even before I met Bill, <laughs> I, I've seen pictures of his uh, from his papers on flies. Um, um, one of the overarching themes and maybe even an obsession is the notion of optimality and performance limits in biological systems that are actually set by physical principles. And another recurrent theme, but perhaps I'm not sure if it, when was the last time it recurred, is the lingering importance of quantum mechanics in biological systems. Um, so I've known Bill and members of his group for a couple of decades now, and probably even early in graduate school. Um, so I've been, I always find out interesting things that Bill is working on or thinking about. Um, um, so one of the things I really miss is having lunches with him upstairs at the Graduate Center. Uh, he is one of the founding directors. Uh, he is the founding director <laughs> of ITS. And so I, I very much look forward to these lunches to resume. Um, lastly, I wanted to comment is that one thing that I feel sets Bill apart from many other fine scientists um, is his breadth in of physics appreciation and ability to listen and ask relevant questions. Um, and I think likely related to this observation is his conviction, at least as far as I can see, to the idea that biophysics is not a separate interdis interdisciplinary discipline, but rather belongs in physics departments proper. Certainly leads by example in being able to stimulate and engage physicists of all stripes. Anyway, I apologize for a long introduction, put a little bit of thought into it uncharacteristically. <laughs> all right. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, thanks, Vadim. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today is, and tomorrow, is to talk about, whoops, sorry. Uh, fantastic. First thing I discover is that the movie's not playing. Um, let's try that again. Uh, which movie though? There was a movie playing on the there right is a movie side. Playing. How nice. Ah, interestingly, fascinating. I'm doing this. In fact, now no, both of them you are don't, you don't. You don't need to know the details. I'm very happy to learn that the movies are playing. Um, so in these two lectures, uh, we're going to talk about the physics of biological systems. And of course, this is, a, this is an incredibly broad subject. Uh, you can address, as a physicist, the phenomena of life at every scale, from thinking about single molecules to thinking about large groups of organisms. You can do it on the time scales that start with the first picosecond after a photosynthetic organism absorbs a photon and starts converting it into energy, all the way out to the time scales of evolution um, over many, many, over thousands of generations. Um, so obviously, we're not going to cover everything in two days. Um, what I want to do is to start by um, sort of figuring out how it is that, that we find our way. Um, what I'm going to do is to sort of plunge in and talk about uh, particular phenomena and get to the point where we can formulate some approaches and then pause and give you the outline for the, for the rest of the, the talks. Okay, so rather than um, Rather than giving you the agenda at the beginning, let me tell, let me let you in on how the agenda gets developed. And um, in terms of interaction, I mean, as everybody knows, uh, the good news is that you can uh, attend these lectures from anywhere in the world. And the bad news is that we're not actually in the same place. So uh, I have 
the group chat window open. I have the window open where I can see if you raise your hand at the risk of, um, of uh, overloading our bandwidth. Those of you who feel comfortable with your uh, video cameras on, that's nice for me because then I look out at actual people instead of little boxes with names on them. Um, uh, and okay, well, and of course there will be, um, there will be moments where we, where we have pauses that are programmed in, um, which are especially for questions. Um, yes, so there will, be, there will be specific question and answer breaks um, actually more than once uh, each day. Um, so let's, let's get started. Um, so the two examples, that, the two movies that you have running in front of you um, are going to turn out to be examples of precision and emergence. Um, let's do the emergence one, which is easier. Um, if you look on the right, uh, what you see is a flock of birds. Um, these are European starlings, and they're doing their thing over the piazza in front of the main train station in Rome, um, which uh, they do in the evenings, uh, not this time of year, but a little, a little earlier. I don't know if they shifted their calendar for the pandemic. Um, and this is sort of obviously an emergent phenomenon. You have thousands of individual birds, each one of which is doing something, but somehow together you get this collective behavior. And so an important aspect of uh, the phenomena of life is that many of the things that we find most interesting uh, at a kind of phenomenological level emerge from the interactions of very large numbers of components. So one example is that in order for you, us to do what we're doing right now, it clearly wouldn't work if every single neuron in our brain did its own thing. Um, it only works because they, uh, thousands and even millions of neurons are working together in some coordinated fashion. And the things that we refer to, I mean, the situation where we're having a conversation, which is not quite what we're doing, is complicated. But if you think, for instance, about remember, you know, sit quietly in a room and remember something, um, to the extent that you can call up an image from your past, you're activating millions of neurons um, in a way that, that is somehow similar to what happened the first time you saw that image, right? And so your recall of a memory quite, quite clearly involves the coordinated activity of a very large number of neurons that are all interacting with each other. So that's an emergent phenomenon and they're emergent phenomena at all scales, okay? On the left in this, um, in, in this first uh, slide, <clears throat> what you see is the complicated dance of cells in uh, the embryo of a fruit fly. Um, so this is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about three hours after the egg was laid and what's, what's been done here, so the egg is about half a millimeter long um, and uh, what's been done here is to genetically engineer the flies so that they make a protein that is fluorescent and lights up all the cells. You'll see, what, and, and you take the embryo and you hold it and you focus your microscope so that it's in the middle of the plane, the middle plane of the embryo, right? So it's a little uh, sort of foot, American football shaped object. Um, and so you lower the plane of focus until you're in the middle which is the, 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 largest, um, the largest distance. I can get both of my hands and feel the view. Um, and uh, in that plane, you'll notice that at this moment, all of the cells are on the outside, right? And the middle is empty, it has egg yolk in it. And this is the moment at which cells, so for the first three hours, cells have divided, but they haven't really moved. They've, they moved to the surface and they stayed there, this is the moment at which cells start to rearrange and form the beginning of the body plan for the animal. And the first thing that you see um, here uh, is the formation of a furrow, and that's separating the first roughly one third of the body from the rest. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, but what I will draw your attention to is this part, um, which is being separated off by this furrow, uh, the part to the left is going to become the head and the, the, what's to the right is going to become the rest of the body. And what is not obvious is that this process is extraordinarily precise. And so we're going we're gonna to come back to that later. So these are two sort of uh, 
avatars for these notions of precision and emergence, which I'm going to get back to. So um, I hope you find the phenomena sort of visually engaging. They're, they're in different ways um, very beautiful. Um, and of course, they're just illustrations. You look around the living world and you see all sorts of things. Um, you would like, I mean, we know we, we, as physicists, we walk around the world with a certain amount of confidence um, that, you know, when we see uh, water cascading over a waterfall or we plug something into the wall, we know that there's a theory we can write down that describes what's going on. And at its base, those theories are um, simple and elegant. When you start applying them in, in you know, kind of real world situations outside the laboratory, things can get complicated but there's this very firm and very compelling theoretical foundation. When you look at pheno the phenomena of life, you're a little bit at sea because you don't, I mean, you don't, we no longer believe that there's a life force. We don't believe that anything's happening that isn't governed by the laws of physics, but we all have to admit that when you look at the phenomena of life, you kind of scratch your head and say, well, I believe that, that all the same physical laws are applicable, but I really don't know how to get that from these laws right? in a way that that's, that's, should bother you. Okay? And it's in that sense um, that, as Vadim was, was saying, I think the phenomena of life were a challenge to physics itself. There's clearly something going on that's not like what's happening in other ways that matter arranges itself. And, and that should bother us and it should motivate us um, to try and understand what's going on. The problem is that um, in contrast to um, our experience, our, our communal experience over centuries in physics, where in some sense, the, the more deeply you look at something, um, the more you discover that there's underlying simplicity. Um, in biology, at least if you learn it from the biologists, it's the other way around. The, the more you look, um, the more complicated it gets. And so if you say, well, I'd like, you know, I'm fascinated by this phenomenon where an embryo is developing and making patterns. So let's, let's try and find out what's going on. Um, what you find out is, oh, geez, it's very complicated. So let's ask a very simple question. This is, this is um, so actually this is a slight cheat. Um, th the thing at the top here is the same kind of embryo that you were looking at before. Again, a fruit fly, half a millimeter long. Um, and again, this is the, and instead of being, instead of looking from the top with a light microscope, you're now looking from the side with an electron microscope. So this thing is now dead, right? It's been fixed. And so you can see it under the electron microscope. And you see it's been caught just at the moment where this furrow is forming. You notice there's another one underneath here, which we could talk about. Um, so it's just at the moment where this furrow is forming. And you know, if you wait a while, um, you don't just get one furrow. Eventually, you're going to produce a little caterpillar, which in the case of a fly is called a maggot. Um, and those of you who've looked at caterpillars know that uh, there are several segments to the body. Um, this particularly uh, cute one is here. Um, this is not a fruit fly uh, maggot. Um, this, is, this is going to become a moth when it goes through metamorphosis. Um, but the body plan for, for uh, most insects is in outline the same. It has these multiple segments. So a question you might ask yourself is, okay, how does the embryo know where to draw this line? Okay. Or eventually, how does it know where to draw all of these lines that you eventually see in the body plan? So this question has a fantastic answer, which is that there's a handful of molecules whose names we know. They are proteins that are encoded in the genome, so we know exactly what they are. We know, the, we know their sequence. In some cases, we know their structure or could find them out. You can get a test tube full of these molecules. And you can measure the concentration of these molecules inside the embryo by a variety of tricks that we could talk about. Okay. And so what's been done here is to take two of these kinds of molecules, and one of them um, has been tagged in green, and one of them has been tagged in orange. And so at places where the concentration of one molecule is large, you get a very bright color. And what you see is that they form stripes. If you 
come away from this talk thinking that the way it works is that to make segments of the body, you just read out the stripes of these patterns of concentration versus position. That's not exactly right, but it's close. So certainly if you ask the basic mystery, how do I, how do I end up with an organism that has a pattern of segments? The answer is that three hours after the egg was laid, so an important thing you need to know about a fruit fly is that the egg hatches in 24 hours. So you start with one cell, and one day later, an animal walks away. Okay, we're a very long way from understanding how that's possible. But if I ask you, how do you make segments? That one, you could say, well, that problem actually gets solved within three hours, because three hours after the egg is laid, if I know which molecules to look at, I can read off what the segments are going to look like. Okay, of course, that problem isn't solved. You have to move cells around, you have to build things and everything else. But in some way, the basic problem of forming a pattern is solved by, by seeing these stripes. So then you ask yourself, well, what sets up these stripes? How did they get there? So the answer is that these are protein molecules. They are encoded in the genome. And Roughly speaking, every cell in your body and every cell in the body of a fruit fly has the same genome because you started with one cell and you just make copies. But as you probably know, your genome encodes um, like 20,000 pro different proteins. And so what makes cells different from one another is how much of each of those proteins they make. So that process is controlled. Every single one of those genes is being controlled for how much it's being read out to synthesize proteins. And the, the molecules that do the control, well, there's many steps of control, but some of them are themselves proteins. And here are four of those proteins, which you can see a little bit before these stripes are formed. So here's one protein that you could say, well, Eventually, I want to make stripes, but maybe the first thing to do is just cut the embryo in half. So you'll notice that this protein has a high concentration in the front half, low concentration in the back half. This protein, which has been stained in blue, um, its high concentration is in the middle, so that allows you to make another cut. There's this yellow thing, which sort of makes cuts that bracket the, the, um, the, the blue and the, actually, I guess it'd be better to point to the green one, which brackets the blue and then the yellow um, provides another bracket. And so what you see is that in fact, there are, you can't see it from here. I've shown you just two of these stripe things. Turns out there's seven of them. There are four of these molecules that make sort of coarser patterns. And so you can imagine at first you set up the coarse pattern and then that somehow drives the formation of the stripes. Um, but we're, now you, set, you see um, the problem that, uh, that the closer you look, the more complicated it gets, right? I have these stripe things, the stripe things are driven by other things. Those things, it turns out, are driven by something else. And how does this driving work anyway? So let's talk about that. Um, let's see, do we get to a blank there? Sorry, could you tell me what you see on the screen? The, um, Same. the slide we've been, we've been on. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's try that again. Yep. Right. Now it's blank. Now it's better. Okay. So in order to make progress, um, we need to know a few facts about cells. And this is on the way to showing you, um, uh, in some sense, how complicated things can get. So in order to do this, I'm going to um, switch to, to um, sketching. Um, and the reason... There's several reasons for that. One is that I want to do this one um, as practice for the other ones that are coming. Uh, but the other thing is I want to make a sketch so that you don't take the um, details too seriously because it is a sketch. Um, ah, somebody asked, sorry, before going on, somebody has asked about um, the symmetry. Um, so anything that looks symmetric, um, is, uh, sorry, 
Um, this is Atiyab Zafar. So, which, so the symmetry that you're referring to is, I think, on this side. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, and the, sym the symmetry is sort of top to bottom that you're thinking about? Yeah. OK, so um, first of all, you'll notice that it's not exact. Um, if you look at the green one, you'll notice that it's fairly extended on the bottom, but not so much on the top. Um, and then the other thing is, um, to, a, to a large extent, there are two axes that you need to pattern in order to build the animal. First, you need to pa pattern the long axis, right? Put your head in the front and put your butt at the back, right? And make the space the legs out, right? That's, the, that's one axis, and that's what corresponds to these segments. But obviously, it's also true that you have to pattern around the embryo, that what you do you know, what you do, what, what's happening over here is not exactly the same as what's happening over here. Now, maybe uh, seen, from, seen from where we are, um, what's happening over here doesn't look that different than what's happening over here, but I assure you it is different, and it, even if it doesn't matter to you, it matters to the little caterpillar. Uh, in particular, you know, there are eyes that if I looked closely at the mouth, I would see eyes and mouth parts and all sorts of other things that, are, that, that vary much more um, along the other axis. So to a, to a good approximation, in, the, in these very early stages, the patterning of the long axis and the azimuthal axis are separate from each other. So there are different molecules that control the different things. You can see that that's not, and, and what I'm talking about is patterning the long axis. Now you can see that that's not exactly true because the object, I mean, the whole object is not, a, is not an object of revolution, right? So there isn't a perfect symmetry. But it's yeah, close. Yeah. Um, OK, is that, is that satisfying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and yes, the lectures are being recorded, um, I hope. And, uh, and they will be posted. Uh, and you can find your way to them through the ITS, um, through the ITS website, as before. So let me now um, try and uh, tell you a few, a couple of facts about cells. So um, every cell in your body um, has uh, the same DNA. So you can imagine that you have a long strand of DNA. And uh, if you look along this long strand, you will find that there is a region, and I'm not gonna do this to scale, because that's too hard, um, there's a region, and what this part does is um, it codes for a protein. So what does that mean? It means right along the DNA, you have a sequence of A, C's, T's, and G's. Those eventually um, will turn into a sequence of amino acids, okay? So the sequence of amino acids for the protein is encoded in the DNA. I don't know how much biology people learn in high school or the beginning of college, so I'm gonna say some things that are very elementary, but I hope that's okay. In order for that to happen, there are two steps. The first thing that happens is you read out the information that's encoded in the DNA, and you make another molecule which is called messenger RNA. And so there's a piece of machinery that does that, um, this is a big thing. Um, and uh, this big uh, machinery, um, ah, somebody is uh, correcting me, but not every cell in our body has the same DNA. In fact, it's because there are, there are exceptions. In fact, there are also really important functional exceptions, uh, like in the immune system. Uh, where, in fact, cells edit their own DNA in order to make the antibodies that protect us against infections. Um, so that's why I said roughly. Uh, and actually, in these very early stages of development, it is more true than it's true la than later. So, um, you know, physicists, uh, we like approximations. So we often, uh, we, we, we tend to drop the, the qualifier, right? Um, when, when we talk about things. So 
roughly every cell in your body has the same DNA. And what distinguishes cells is that they read out different parts of the DNA to make different amounts of the different proteins. And with a few exceptions, um, the, uh, that is, that's the sort of overwhelming difference between cells. There are these other examples, um, which are very important. But I'm going to leave those aside for the moment. So there's this big um, molecular complex, um, which if you were a bacterium would have only uh, a couple of proteins, but if you're an animal like us or a fruit fly, it's really big and complicated and I don't want to talk about it. And what it does is it literally marches along the DNA molecule and spits out as it does so behind it, a messenger RNA molecule. And that messenger RNA molecule has the same information as the, uh -huh. and interestingly, the thing that I just did did not get shared. So let's try that again. There we go. Um, it's good to actually keep the shared thing open so I can tell whether it's working. Um, the, the messenger RNA molecule has the same information as was encoded in the DNA. It's in a slightly different form. And that messenger RNA molecule um, goes to a place called the ribosome. And the ribosome then uses the messenger RNA as a template to grab amino acids out of the solution and spit out protein. And this protein is the protein that was encoded by that gene. Okay. <clears throat> so the, that's how proteins get synthesized from DNA. Um, and what's important is that this process is regulated. So you can see that there are many steps where you could regulate it. For one thing, the protein doesn't stay there forever. It can be degraded. So one way to regulate this process is to just get rid of some of the protein that you've already made, and now you have less of it. Obviously, that's important sometimes, but that better not be the only thing. You could regulate the process by which messenger RNA is translated into protein at the ribosome, and that's important. But the other thing you could do, which is in some way the most efficient thing to do, is to regulate the process of making the messenger RNA itself. So if you don't want to make this protein, the best thing to do would be to just not make the messenger RNA. Conversely, if you really want to start making the protein, you should start making the messenger RNA. So how do you do that? Well, it turns out that there are particular sites along the DNA where other proteins, so we're really good at this. I have decided in advance which colors to use, but never mind. These other proteins can come and bind to those particular sites along the DNA. Again, we have a problem. Um, so these particular proteins can come and bind to these sites along the DNA. And by doing so, they can influence whether this whole process of, as it's called, transcribing the DNA into RNA gets started or not. Okay. If you're a bacterium, then this is really simple. These binding sites are very close to where the start is. And one way to inhibit, or as it's called, repress the synthesis of messenger RNA is to just bind here and get in the way. You can also imagine that you could bind not at the point where you get in the way, but close enough that it actually makes it easier for this big green thing to bind because it can stick to the purple molecule. And in this way, you can, you can easily picture that when these molecules bind, they can influence whether you read out the information in the DNA or not, and hence whether you make this protein. Now, in animals like us and in flies, it's, there's another problem, which is that we know where these sites are along the DNA, and actually they don't fit in the picture that I've drawn. They're very far away. So there's a question of how things that happen so far away along the DNA sequence can have an influence on whether the gene gets transcribed or not. So part of that is that the DNA can fold up, and things can, that are far apart along the DNA can touch each other in real space, in three-dimensional space. 
but that seems not to be the whole story. So there's another physics problem there, which is not the one that I'm going to talk about today. But I wanted to be sure that you had this picture in your mind. The way in which you regulate how much of a protein you make is you have other proteins, um, which are called transcription factors. And those proteins can bind to DNA and turn on or off the, read the synthesis of other proteins. But of course, these proteins are coded somewhere else in the DNA. And the same thing is happening there. So you have this whole network of interactions where you have transcription factor proteins, which influence the synthesis of other proteins, including other transcription factor proteins. And this feeds back on each other. So how do you turn those pictures into equations? Well, let's do something simple. Um, let's imagine that we have two proteins. And protein number two is a transcription factor that influences the synthesis of protein number one. So quite generally, you might say, well, the rate at which the concentration of protein number one changes has two terms. One is that the proteins are being degraded. Or if these were bacteria, I mean, it's also true, right, that if I have a lot of proteins in the cell and the cell divides, then each cell now has fewer proteins. Of course, it also has a lower volume. So you have to decide whether you're counting concentration or, or counting molecules. But in any case, there are ways in which the concentration can go down. So the typical thing would be say, well, there's some time scale in which that happens. And then we know that the proteins are being synthesized. So there's some maximum rate at which this can happen. And then the actual rate depends on how much of this transcription factor is present. And presumably, there's also a dynamics for the other protein. So what, how do you think this function is going to behave? Well, if this picture of, of things binding to particular sites along DNA is the right picture, then, and that's what influences things, you could say, well, I don't know exactly how it works. But what I expect is that the the rate at which I'm synthesizing thing, synthesizing the protein is related to what fraction of those binding sites are occupied. But whether a binding site is occupied or not occupied is a problem from your statistical mechanics or physical chemistry course, right? I have a binding site. If it's empty, it has some energy. If it's bound, it has some other energy. But I had to take one molecule out of solution in order for it to bind. So there's a term for the chemical potential, right? comes from taking one molecule out of solution. The chemical potential, as long as the concentration is not too high, the chemical potential is proportional to the logarithm of the concentration. The fraction of sites that are in this state versus this state should be given by the Boltzmann distribution. And if you work things out, you get um, a picture which uh, is quite familiar, that the fraction of binding sites that are occupied is proportional to the number of molecules that can stick divided by the number of molecules plus a constant that tells you at what point um, things are halfway. So the picture that you get, and um, again, I'm not sure why the updating is tricky, but that doesn't matter, um, is this one. And we have some functional form here. And uh, it's convenient to get rid, of, uh, get rid of the units, right? So you want to measure the constant, you measure the number of molecules in terms of the maximum number that you could get in steady state. And then you get something that looks a little simpler. Um, you have that the rate of change with some characteristic time, it can decay and it can be synthesized. And there's some simple formula for what the regulation function is. This idea that one molecule is binding is too simple. So you can imagine that many molecules uh, bind um, at the same time. And if they're cooperative, then instead of getting g to the first power, you get g to the nth power. And so we draw these little pictures. Um, there's a question that, which I will get to in just a moment. We draw these little pictures where we say there's one protein molecule that influences the synthesis of another protein molecule, and we draw an arrow. And if, it was, if there was one molecule um, that binds to DNA and influences things, then this function would look like the blue curve. And if there are five molecules that all bind cooperatively, you get something much steeper, starts to approach something that looks like a switch. And as we discussed, 
you can have things that turn things on and you can have things that turn things off, okay? The thing I want you to take away from this is that if you take all the molecular details seriously, you can imagine writing down exactly what the equations are for all this, some approximation, but you'll notice that, there, that in order to draw this picture where one protein influences the synthesis of another protein, you draw an arrow and um, hidden in that arrow are actually two parameters. One, at least two parameters, uh, one is the steepness of this curve, which is the value of n in this exponent here. And the other is the scale on the x-axis. You see, by a trick, right, we can always normalize the y-axis so that it runs from 0 to 1. This 0 means you're not synthesizing the protein. 1 means you're synthesizing it at the maximum possible rate. But then the x-axis still has units, right? It's the number of molecules or the concentration or something like that. And we've absorbed that into this constant k. So when I draw this picture with an arrow, there are at least two parameters hiding from me in this, in this simple looking diagram. Let me, be sh let me catch up with the questions. Um, how does the right mRNA form every single time? Um, so uh, a typical protein is, let's say, a couple of hundred amino acids long. Um, a uh, you know that in order to get from uh, the bases along DNA to amino acids, right, there's four bases of 20 amino acids, so you have to read them out three at a time. So that means that to encode 300 amino acids, I need almost, I need 900 bases. Okay. The RNA polymerase um, uh, will make a mistake and put in the wrong base um, on average uh, once every um, 10,000 times. So it's not perfect, but it's close. And in particular, it means that you can read out the entire sequence on average without making a mistake. It's also true that there's a beautiful bit of physics of um, proofreading so that if you make a mistake, you can go back and correct it. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother discussion. If people would like um, uh, some references for that, I can, um, I can make a note. Um, actually, um, let me see if I can make a note now. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe I'll make a note here. Let's see, does this work? There we are. Good. So you'd like a reference about proofreading. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge the slides and the things that I drew. Um, and uh, we'll post those. And so since questions got asked, I'll try and uh, put um, uh, some extra references in there. Uh, so that was one question. Um, we're assuming this means thermal equilibrium. OK, so um, uh, and there's a quick question, is f of g similar to the Hill function? So that one's easy. Yes, it's, it is the Hill function. And actually, Hill, um, the first, the Hill of the Hill function, uh, he was studying the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. And so it has its origins, although it's used in other contexts, it has its origins in a biological problem. Um, we assumed things were in thermal equilibrium. So the we assume, well, the thing that we assumed was that the binding of, this, of these transcription factor proteins to their sites along DNA was in thermal equilibrium. Um, that could be true even if the whole cell is not in thermal equilibrium. Um, it's, of course, also possible that it's not true. Um, the problem isn't that the temperature is changing. The problem is that there are lots of chemical reactions happening that are dissipating energy. And so figuring out where in the system that pushes you away from thermal equilibrium is complicated. Okay? So you should view that thermal equilibrium argument more as uh, um, a kind of guide, right? I mean, what we really needed was this function f of g. And I could have said, oh, it should just look like this. So I could have just said, you know, g1 dot with some time scale is minus g1 plus f of g2. And I could have said, what does f look like? 
well, I would like it to be true that if there's not much of this protein, you don't synthesize anything. And since F runs from zero to one, I could say, well, if I have lots of this protein, I want to synthesize things at the maximal rate. And then it should look like that. And I don't need a model. I mean, I could, I don't need a description of what's happening molecularly to tell you that I think it should look like that. But it's nice to have at least some molecular thing in mind so that you can ground yourself. Um, so that's the, that's the origin. So the question of whether you should think about these things as being in equilibrium or not um, is a very important one, but I don't think it affects anything that I'm saying right now. Um, yes, okay. We're gonna spend some time talking about maximum entropy distributions. Um, so uh, let's leave that for now. And what does the green arrow represent in the cell sketch. Let's go back. Ah, so this green arrow um, represents this big complex uh, literally moving along the DNA molecule as it synthesizes the messenger RNA. Remember the, the DNA, right? There's a sequence, so A, T, C, G, and so on, all along the DNA. And I want to make a messenger RNA molecule that carries the same information. It's complementary to it. Um, so where there's an A, you want to put a T, uh, where there's a C, you want to put a G, except it's messenger RNA, so you, use a, you don't use exactly the same four bases, but that, that isn't crucial for what we're saying here. So in order to do that, what I do is it, I, the, the cell has a molecule that can literally walk along the DNA molecule and, um, and sort of copy base by base. And I should say that a beautiful part of, of modern uh, biophysics is that you can observe that process one molecule at a time. So you can hold on to a piece of DNA and you can hold on to this RNA polymerase molecule and you can watch it walking and you can see it walk step by step uh, one base pair at a time. This is a be very beautiful experiment. And then you can see that when it makes mistakes, it backs up and corrects them, which is another beautiful piece of physics. Okay. Uh, so we got to here and to here. And now we have the problem of trying to put um, this uh, picture together. And let's go back to the fly embryo. And in the fly embryo, um, we agreed that there are um, these uh, different um, molecules. We said there are seven of them that make the stripes. There are four of them that make these sort of broader patterns. They're called gap genes. And then it turns out that these molecules are controlled by other molecules which are placed by the mother. So for example, what the mother does is to put the messenger RNA for this particular molecule, which has a name, and I'm going to try to avoid names. I should have called them one, two, and three. Um, uh, at the at the end of the embryo that will eventually become the head, and then after the egg is laid, the protein starts to be translated from the messenger RNA in the ribosomes and spreads throughout the embryo, but that still leaves higher concentration at the head than at the tail. And there's another molecule that does the same thing from the other side, and then there's a special molecule that marks the ends as opposed to the middle. So those are placed there by the mother when the egg is laid, when the egg is made, and then when it's laid, and then um, these drive these are transcription factors that control the gap genes. The gap genes are transcription factors that control the parallel genes. There's evidence that all of these gap genes interact with each other. Mostly, they turn each other off, which explains why. Um, you see the borders uh, not uh, sort of touching each other the way they do. It's possible that one of them turns itself on, which is kind of interesting. There may be a few other things scattered through here. Um, but what's important is to realize that if you start counting arrows, and I haven't drawn all the arrows because the figure becomes very busy. I just focused on this one. You'll see there's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 13, uh, 
two, four, six, eight, 13. There's 13 arrows. And we said that every arrow is hiding two parameters. So just to describe the gap genes, I need 26 parameters. And if I wanted to describe this whole process, I'd need at least 50 parameters. And everybody's already pointed out the, um, that our description of this in terms of these simple models, right? If it's not in equilibrium, then it's more complicated than the two parameters that I just described. And I haven't actually been faithful to the dynamics having one piece that comes from the uh, making the messenger RNA and then making the protein. There's a whole variety of things that, that, um, that you could worry about. Um, let me hold questions for a little bit um, because I want to see if I can get uh, um, to the end here. I, I want to make, I want to set the, the stage and then we can, we can go back to the questions. Um, and um, you should be worried about the fact that we have so many parameters. The, in physics, we certainly have models that have parameters. Um, so famously, um, in particle physics, if you write down the standard model, it turns out that it has 18 arbitrary parameters. There's this very charming article from uh, many years ago, uh, which points this out um, and talks about um, why the values of these parameters actually matter um, to, as they put it, your everyday life. But usually, if there's lots of parameters, we assume that we're missing something. Let me remind you, if we wanted to describe just this very beginning processes of making the pattern along one axis in the fly embryo, we'd get to 50 parameters. Um, let me remind you that you can explain the periodic table by knowing one parameter, which is the fine structure constant. Right? And in fact, you could argue that some of this happens without even knowing that parameter. So you could, I mean, if you, if you really want to understand the energy scales and everything, you need that. But um, uh, you could get a lot, for example, I'm pretty sure you can understand why it is that carbon likes to form four bonds and why they tend to be tetrahedral and all that without actually knowing the numerical value of the fine structure constant. So a lot of what you know about chemistry, including the whole structure of the periodic table, you can get from one parameter. And in fact, there are examples where you can make compelling quantitative predictions with zero parameters. And some of the most beautiful examples come uh, in critical phenomena, whereas many of you know, there are these scaling behaviors, um, which are described by, by pure numbers, right? Uh, the critical exponents. And the theory of those critical exponents doesn't have parameters that you fit, right? If, you're, if the ordering of the system is the ordering of something scalar, like the difference between um, a liquid and a gas, right? The difference between liquid and gas is a density. A density is a scalar, and you're in that has so that has one that has you know one component, and you're in three dimensions. Then the predictions for the critical exponents, uh, the behavior near the critical point of uh, liquid of, between a liquid and a gas, are a collection of pure numbers that don't have any parameters that you can adjust, and either you get them right or you get them wrong and you get them right to three decimal places um, in experiments on real materials, okay? So um, I think some of the great triumphs of physics are quite specifically giving a compelling account of the world without having to fit lots of parameters. So in the context of um, biological systems, you have to decide what you're going to do. So if as a physicist, you find this very large number of parameters disturbing, then you have to make a choice. So one idea is you give up and you say that, that you stop being a physicist and you just embrace the complexity of biology. Um, uh, and um, well, um, I'm not ready to do that. So um, we're not gonna do that one. Uh, the other possibility is that you know, there are lots of parameters, but part of the lesson, you, you've heard lectures already, right? One lesson of modern deep networks is that you can make successful predictions about things, even when you don't actually, you don't even have enough data to determine all the parameters. So somehow the obsession with there being too many parameters might be missing something, right? 
that you could have some kind of understanding and in particular some kind of predictive power in the complete in the absence of being able to determine all those parameters and what we heard um, from Catherine early earlier I guess last month um, is about the fact that in many models what you find is that some combinations of parameters are very important and other ones are not and so the fact the total count of parameters might be misleading so maybe there's a much more limited set of parameters that are essential for understanding what's going on. There are two more possibilities. One is that, which has already been hinted at in some of the questions, is that after all the parameters that we see in real organisms, so it is disturbing. It, there is a line of thought, for example, that says that the 18 parameters of the standard model are chosen to make sure that we can be here now and have this conversation about the 18 parameters of the standard model. That's called the anthropic principle. And that sounds weird, but you could say that, you know, if you imagine that there are many universes, right, and there's many different values, there's generally speaking the same kind of physics in all the universes, but all the parameters are different. The fact that we happen to be here actually constrains the parameters significantly. I don't know whether it constrains them enough to make quantitative predictions, but it does, that, that's one line of thought. Now that makes a lot of physicists uncomfortable for reasons that I think you can understand. And I don't wanna have that argument, but when it comes to biological systems, of course, there's been billions of years of evolution. And so there has been a selection of the parameters for things that actually work. I presume that if you take the chemical reactions that are happening inside the cell and you give them all random values for the parameters that they're doing, you, the cell, you, know, you won't get an embryo that, that uh, a day later can get up and walk away, right? You don't get from one cell to a whole animal if you set all of the parameters equal to random numbers. So is it possible that evolution has selected hard enough that there's something that we can cut through all of these parameters by insisting that the parameters are such that certain functional behaviors work. And maybe if we look carefully, we'll realize that they work so well that that's a very tight constraint. So maybe there's even a notion of optimization. The alternative is something more like what happens at a critical point where um, you know that as you pass quite generally, not just at critical points, but generally, as you pass from a description of what happens on a microscopic scale to what happens on a macroscopic scale, things actually get simpler. So for instance, molecular dynamics is complicated, but fluid mechanics, the equations of fluid mechanics are much simpler. So as you pass from looking at molecular dynamics of fluids, every, single, every different way of making the fluid out of different kinds of molecules gives you different equations at the microscopic scale. But by the time you pass to the macroscopic scale, you get back the Navier-Stokes equations, right? And the only thing that's left are a couple of parameters like the density and viscosity that tell you, that tell you um, where, uh, you know, what the original fluids were made out of, but that's nowhere near all of the molecular detail. So we know in physics that as we pass from the microscopic to the macroscopic, there's a kind of emergent simplicity. And since most of the things that we find fascinating about biological systems are macros relatively macroscopic phenomena, maybe it's also true that as we pass from the molecular to the macroscopic, all of this uh, complexity will uh, disappear and we'll recover a description which is much simpler. And so the two ideas that I wanna pursue over the next, I guess we have an hour and a half, an hour today and two hours tomorrow, um, is these two ideas. One is the sort of selection of parameters by evolution, and the other is this emergence of simplicity as we go to the macro pass from the microscopic to the macroscopic. And the point I wanted to make here is that if you look across the whole panoply of what people do in trying to describe the physics of biological systems, you can kind of put, them, put all of the work into these different categories. And they're all interesting, right? Um, I have my favorites, which is what I'm gonna talk about, but there's something interesting about all of these different approaches. And so it's useful to sort of step back and, and think about connections between very different problems that are, where the connection lies in their, uh, the, the reaction to the proliferation of parameters. And so this leaves us then with um, 
a plan, um, which is that for the rest of today, we're going to talk about the fact that flight development is precise. We're going to talk about what the limits are. Um, and then we're going to talk about a specific notion of optimization. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk more about emergence, focusing not on birds, but on networks of neurons, not on flocks of birds, but on networks of neurons. And so um, the pauses are programmed in here. Um, there are pauses for questions, but um, certainly since it is noon, and we've been doing this for an hour, or embarrassingly, to be more precise, I've been doing this for an hour, um, uh, we should pause now. So let me suggest that what we do here is um, uh, we, um, be, we come back at 12.10 uh, p.m. Uh, that's Eastern time. And uh, by then you will have collected. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the question is uh, phrased uh, from Giannis about what, what motivates the RNA polymerase to start scanning the DNA uh, to construct messenger RNA. Um, so, uh, well, one should be careful about words like motivation. Um, but more to more concretely, uh, the RNA polymerase, so let's talk about the simple case in bacteria where the number of molecular components is not so large. And so you can do everything in a test tube, or in fact, you can do it literally holding on to the individual molecules. Um, so there, the RNA polymerase will, will stick to any piece of DNA that has a particular short sequence where it likes to start. And once it sticks, it will start walking in one direction along the DNA, um, more or less without any further, uh, without any further stimuli. So in that sense, uh, and, and you, don't have, you don't have different RNA polymerases for different genes, again, roughly. So what you can think about is that all of the genes are read by the same RNA polymerase. And so, um, and so in that sense, if you want to regulate the process, you have to regulate whether the RNA polymerase gets started or not, and whether it finds its way to that initial binding site. And there's a large amount of work on this, um, which, on which I'm not an expert, um, but it is a very beautiful uh, sort of part of uh, the, the sort of physics community's engagement with biological molecules. So let me, let me leave the problem of RNA polymerase for a while. And yes, of course, the, I mean, there has to be a reason, for example, why it walks in one direction and not the other. Um, <clears throat> where does it start? Uh, there, is, uh, um, there is a specific sequence that is the start signal, which is the thing that the RNA polymerase binds to. And there are specific sequences which are stop signals, at which point the RNA polymerase stops and falls off. Um, <clears throat> and yes, if it started at the end, that would be bad. So that's important. Uh, uh, so John Vastola asks whether the different approaches that I um, pointed to, um, you know, I, you, I, I emphasized that, you know, they, they're, they each are productive in their own way. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on two of them. And the question is whether these are in some way uh, more or less, as he puts it, more or less right or falsifiable. Um, so I hope you'll see that um, in, the two in the two approaches that I talk about, we get to the point where we're making comparisons between theory and experiment that are sufficiently precise that you're testing the underlying idea. So one of the challenges in systems that are this complex is not only finding some way of simplifying things and cutting through the complexity that you find satisfying, but also even if you succeed and get all the way to the end and you say, okay, I have a theory and it works, are you really sure that the part that makes it work was the deep part of the beginning hypothesis and not something else? Right? So it could be that you get some things right um, 
for not the reasons you think. So you have to be skeptical. Um, but I think uh, an important standard, as in the rest of physics, is that we need a quantitative confrontation between theory and experiment at the end. Uh, and Ernan asks whether um, symmetries will help you select the parameters. Um, uh, you need a really good idea about what kinds of symmetry to, um, to include. Um, the molecules themselves are not terribly symmetric. Um, and so, Um, Bill, you're muted, I think. Aha. Uh -huh. So have I, been, have I been muted since you came back? No, okay. Ah, oh, I see. Yes, in, I, I, I think I understand what happened. Um, uh, sorry, one of my helpful co-hosts muted me. Um, <laughs> It's fine, uh, right? So the answer to the question about symmetry is is that I can't I can't think of a good um, example where symmetry has helped in part because these systems aren't very symmetric. Um, but uh, um, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we aren't missing something. So let's, if it's okay, um, shall we plunge forward a little bit? Um, I really don't understand why the um, <clears throat> the slides don't do uh, what you might hope, but um, that's okay. Um, let's try again. So what I'd like to do is to um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> the observation that, that uh, um, fly development is precise. And I'm gonna give you one example of this precision um, just to motivate the things that, that come later. So let me say um, to start, there is an overwhelming prejudice that biological systems are not very precise. Um, and this prejudice uh, is not confined to either the physics or biology side of things. Uh, biologists will sometimes tell you that, um, that uh, everything in biology is messy and complicated and they get suspicious of arguments that, that rest on, on uh, things that are very highly precise. It's also true that, that uh, for example, until recently, it simply wasn't possible to measure the concentration of a protein molecule inside a living cell very accurately. And so if it's not possible for us to measure it, it's hard to imagine that that number really is important to the cell either. Um, maybe that is bad philosophy of science, but um, you can understand how it happens, right? It's if you have a view of the world in which the important things are things that you can't measure, that's not very productive. So you try to go forward with the things that you can measure. Conversely, I think when physicists look at the complexity of biology, it's very difficult to imagine that there's anything very precise going on underneath that. So part of what I wanna do here is to give you um, a concrete example. Um, and indeed, um, this is not working so well. So let's, uh, um, maybe in fact, maybe I'll just leave it this way and not do the full screen thing. Um, if, if things are visible. So um, this is the picture that you've seen already, um, which is a fly embryo uh, um, um, uh, that is uh, making this thing called the cephalic furrow, um, which separates the head from the rest of the body. <clears throat> and uh, uh, here you see two electron micrographs, one of which you've seen before, after the furrow has formed, and this is an electron micrograph of, of course, not the same embryo because when you take the electron micrograph, it, it dies, right? Uh, uh, but an embryo um, just a few minutes earlier. So this difference here is about 10 minutes in the life of the fly. And you can see that during that period, this uh, furrow forms. So if you do uh, this experiment, which is live, right? You can uh, see, um, what, oh, let's get rid of that. Hmm. Oh, I see what's going on, good. Um, 
if you uh, if you do this experiment live, right, instead of doing it on one embryo, you can do it on 100 embryos, in fact, more. And for each embryo, you can measure the length of the embryo and you can measure the position at which the furrow forms. And then you can look at the distribution over, I think in this case, there were more than 300 embryos um, uh, of this ratio of, you know, where is this relative to the length of the embryo? And you see that the distribution is approximately Gaussian. And if you read off the parameters, you see that the mean is a third, well, 0.34. Um, so the furrow forms, it corresponds to your visual impression that this is about one third of the way from the front to the back. Um, but what's astonishing is the width of the distribution, the standard deviation is 0.01. So what this tells you is that when, um, when, when a single fruit fly mother lays egg after egg after egg after egg after egg, and each of those embryos then develops um, on its own, uh, the precision with which the, the position of the neck, right, the thing that's going to separate the head from the rest of the body, that line is drawn with an accuracy of 1% along the length of the embryo. And at the moment when it's drawn, if you count the cells, you find that there are fewer than 100 rows of cells from one end to the other. And so that means that in some sense, the 32nd cell that knows that it's supposed to become part of the head and the 33rd cell knows that it's supposed to become part of the rest of the body. So you can't get more precise than that. Now we know that this is ultimately driven by the concentrations of particular molecules. So let's, for example, right, you go from these maternal inputs, right, the molecules that the mother puts in place to these gap genes that form uh, profiles that are, that are relatively broad and then those eventually make these stripes. And the position of the cephalic furrow is between the first orange and green stripe that I showed you in one of those early pictures. Okay. So let's go all the way back to the signals that are provided by the mother and ask if you want 1% accuracy along the positional axis, how much accuracy do you need in order to measure the concentration? Right? If, this, if ultimately the way it works, uh, is, um, is whether is that there are molecules whose concentrations drive this process, then um, measuring position ultimately comes down to measuring concentration. So maybe you've been in public buildings where they paint the floor so that you know where to walk. So what's happening is that the, the embryo is being painted and it's not that you know, the blue things become feet and the, and the uh, red things become, um, uh, become eyes. It's rather that if you look at how, uh, how intense the color blue is uh, from one end to the other, the things that are the, the really intense saturated blue become part of the head and the things that are the pale blue become part of the tail. Okay, so let's measure uh, what that is. So what do you do? Um, you genetically engineer the fly so that instead of making, the, so that you basically take the gene that codes for the protein that you're interested in, you take it out of the fly, you then take a gene that codes for a protein which is fl naturally fluorescent, you attach it to the other gene, and you put this back in. And now every time the fly makes this protein, it will make the fluorescent protein along with it, and they'll be attached. So that means that you've essentially lit up every single one of these molecules. And so now you look under the microscope and see how much fluorescence there is. The fluorescence is proportional to the concentration, and you can calibrate, you can check all these things. This is a, I mean, there's a lot to be said here. Um, and what you see here is the concentration, the, the fluorescence, in every single one of these cells, slight point, um, the fly is special. These, in these early stages of development, things are happening so fast that the cells don't stop to build membranes to separate them. And so the things that you see here are actually not cells. Those are the nuclei of cells that have been duplicating. And there will be a pause just before 
the folding to make the cephalic furrow, there'll be a pause for the embryo to stop and build the walls, well, membranes, walls, or something else, um, basically build walls between the cells, right? So at this stage, the interior is one big bag with lots of nuclei in it. And since this protein is a transcription factor, it has to bind to DNA, the DNA is in the nucleus, so you see that it's localized in the nuclei. How that happens is another interesting story. That's, that we sort of understand. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something one could put uh, aside. Um, so you can now zero in on each one of these nuclei, measure the concentration, the fluorescence, and calibrate that in terms of concentration. And this is what you see here. And so you can see that at the back, the concentration really is very, very low. And then it peaks up here. Um, and uh, you can discuss whether it peaks at zero or a little bit positive. Um, that's not so crucial. Um, throughout this region, through most of the place where all the stripes get formed, um, this profile is approximately exponential. And so that means that if you look at the average behavior, shifting by 1% along the x-axis turns out to be the same as shifting by 10% along the concentration axis. Okay, you can verify that by going to here. It's 10, you move up and down by plus or minus one, and you'll see that that moves you about 1% along the x-axis. So that says that if you think that this is ultimately the signal that drives position, that drives the position of things, and we know it is, for example, if you double the concentration of this, then the position of the cephalic furrow moves. And you can double it very easily by putting in, an, putting in extra copies of the gene. Or you can cut it in half because there are two copies of the gene and you can get rid of one of them. And then the cephalic furrow goes in the wrong place. So that's actually how this molecule is found. It's one of the ways we know about this molecule. So if you think that the embryo is effectively reading this concentration in order to determine positions, every cell is saying, oh, I'm a cell that has concentration 20 nanomolars, so I must be um, here at about 25% of the way, then if, if that cell wants to know its position um, with 1% accuracy along the x-axis, it needs to know its position um, with 10, it needs to know concentration with an accuracy of 10%. There's a flip side to that, which is that if you want different embryos, so two cells that differ in concentration by 10% should do something different, one of them will become part of the head and one of them will become part of the rest of the body. But then if you look at two different embryos, two cells that are in the same place will only do the same thing if the concentration is the same to within 10%. And in fact, um, the different colored dots here are coming from different embryos. And so what you see is that the absolute concentration is in fact reproducible from embryo to embryo at a 10% level. And furthermore, I told you that this is a protein whose for which the messenger RNA is placed at the head by the mother, at the eventual head by the mother, and then you can count those messenger RNA molecules, and you find out that those are also reproducible to better than, that count is reproducible to better than 10%. So contrary to what most people thought when we got involved in all this, um, it really is true that absolute concentrations uh, are at, constant differences in absolute concentration of order 10% are meaningful to the embryo. And, um, and absolute concentrations are reproducible at the 10% level. It's quite surprising. So the question is, should you, should you be surprised by this level of precision? Um, so somebody asked, okay, a couple of questions have already come up. Um, one is about whether reproducibility is only the same for the, with the same mother or all eggs of the same species. <clears throat> different members of the same species are genetically different from one another. Look around the room, you can see that, right? We're all the same species, but, uh, but there are inherited differences. That's true for flies too. Some of the, and so if you measure carefully, you can see that there's more variability if you choose flies at random than if you choose uh, inbred lines that you keep in the laboratory in an attempt to minimize genetic variation. So in order to ask the question about reproducibility, you'd really like to ask it about genetically identical embryos. That's hard to do, but having them uh, laid by the same mother 
Um, in some cases, you know, even from the same father, uh, then you get closer, obviously. That, again, because these are lines that are kept in the laboratory and you've sort of purified out, right? You keep breeding, you do the thing that you shouldn't do out in the real world, which is you keep breeding them with their siblings, right? Until you gradually push all of the genetic variation out. So um, the, uh, so that's um, that, that question. Are there instances where two nuclei swap their position and only take on the role of the other? So if the fly makes mistakes at this early stage, they can be corrected later, but they come at enormous cost. So errors in the early stages of development are either fatal or get corrected. So, um, so what happens is that you know all the all of the eggs that eventually hatch look surprisingly normal, given that you did something weird at the beginning, but only a very tiny fraction of them actually hatch. So there's an interesting question of how you do that, but it's clear that it comes at a gigantic cost. Okay. So, um, so it's important to the animal that it actually get this right. Uh, it's positional accuracy, uh, teratogenesis differences in density. Teratogenesis. So, uh, so the molecule, all the molecules that we're talking about here are proteins that act as transcription factors. Um, I have to admit that I don't know the word teratogenesis. Um, so somebody will have to tell me what that means. And is the positional accuracy, uh, it's 1% and there are 100 cells, or is 1% 1%? Um, there's, the, this is a really interesting question. Um, you know that, that if you, if I give you two numbers, which are one, you know, let's say, you know, 0.33 and 0.34, Right. If those, if the error bars on those numbers are one percent, then obviously I can't tell them apart because they only differ by one percent. But then you have to ask yourself, well, how small do I need to make the error bar until I'm sure that um, that that I don't confuse that two cells don't get confused with each other? Um, it turns out that the error bars are small enough that the probability of two cells next to each other being confused about which one is which is very small, but probably not small enough because there's lots of cells. Fortunately, it turns out that the errors are correlated. And so, um, and so uh, the result is that, that um, the probability of two cells being confused is actually smaller than you would think even from the error bar. That's a that's sort of an, that's another layer of complexity. So essentially, right, what we're now doing is saying not only are things precise, but the details of the correlations in the noise are act, might actually be important, which is so far from where the field started, you know, 20 years ago. That I would, you know, that that if 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 that's where you think our understanding ends, that's okay, right? Um, uh, uh, about morphological abnormalities. Um, so, uh, and yes, we're having this discussion in the period before cells start, just before cells start moving, right? So it's sort of laying out the blueprint. And let me emphasize that it's, if you look at those stripes in the, you know, the green and orange stripes, it's a remarkable fact that the thing is set up so that you can see the pattern before the cells actually start moving around, right? Didn't have to be that way. Um, so, so at least conceptually, you can separate the problem of cells figuring out where they are from figuring out what they should do given where they are. Um, and then the, uh, this is about morphological abnormalities. The way in which all of these molecules were identified was by looking for morphological abnormalities in the development of the embryo. Most of the time, they're fatal. So um, you don't actually get to see morphological abnormalities in, in the adult animal. Um, it's actually a very beautiful uh, subject, how, how it was done, um, but I, I could, um, let me make a note actually. Uh, so it would be good to have references to, um, to the identification of these molecules. 
it's it's a very beautiful subject. Um, good. So I've convinced you that 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 development is precise, and now we want to talk about whether you should be surprised by this or not. So should you be surprised? So if, if you have 1% accuracy in position, that means that the cell is effectively measuring um, uh, concentrations with 10% accuracy. And should you find that surprising or not? And this is, there's, a, there's a, a, a wonderful subject about um, of trying to understand what are the physical limits to the ability of a cell to measure concentration differences. And this goes back to this classic paper written by Howard Berg and Ed Purcell in 1977. So um, they were actually interested not in anything related to the control of reading out genetic information or embryos. They were actually interested in how bacteria swim around and find their way up the gradient of concentration of good things down the gradient of concentration of things they don't like. Uh, Howard Berg is, is, was, is one of the pioneers of um, understanding how bacteria swim. He's the person who discovered that bacteria swim by having a rotary motor. Um, and Ed Purcell is one of the people who discovered NMR, um, by the way. Uh, so um, this is the Purcell of Purcell and Pound. Um, uh, so uh, this is really a classic paper. Um, it is, I recommend it to everyone. Uh, it's really one of the great papers in the physics of biological systems. Um, the paper on the right uh, was written because if you read Berg and Purcell, it, it is partly remarkable because they have this amazing intuitive style. Um, they, they give arguments which are sort of very engaging, but you're not quite sure how general they are because they rest on intuition. And there's lots of analogies and all sorts of other things. So it's a fantastic paper to read, but you're left wondering, um, they, they claim at the end that there's a limit to how precisely cells can measure concentration. And you're not really sure whether it's a limit or not because the argument was so intuitive and you'd like to make it more rigorous. So um, we got interested in this because we were starting to think about the problems I'm talking to you about right now. And we wanted to know whether we could carry the same arguments over. And so we wrote this paper in which we tried to make the arguments of Berg and Purcell more rigorous. And it turned out that that touched off a whole um, uh, collection of things, which has been a lot of fun. Um, I would say that the short answer is Berg and Purcell were right. And there might be a factor of two out in front of the argument. So indeed, they gave a slightly hand wavy argument. And there's a little hand wavy bit out in front where maybe there's a factor of two. Um, but that's OK for all of our purposes. So I think everybody, not everybody needs to know what's happened, what we did in 2005 and what happened afterwards. Uh, but everybody should know the Berg Purcell argument. So let me give you the Berg Purcell argument. Uh, which is enough um, for our purposes. There. So the Bird Purcell argument um, is the following. So let's imagine that what you're going to do is you're going to measure concentration of a molecule by using a detector whose linear dimensions are A. And so what that means effectively is that you're going to count you're going to count molecules in a box of size a cubed. Right? So what's happening with these molecules that you're counting? Well, they're out here in solution. And some of them diffuse into the volume that you happen to be counting in. So if you take a snapshot, you count some number n. What's the average of the number n? Well, the molecules are at concentration C outside. And they diffuse in and out of the volume that you're looking at. So they're at concentration C inside as well. But what does concentration mean? It means that if you look in a volume, the number of molecules you'll count on average is the concentration multiplied by the volume. So it's C times A cubed. But you know that the molecules are moving around at random. So you happen to find, so one way to think about it is that in any snapshot, 
the, the, the positions of the molecules are put down at random in space. And so you happen to find n of them inside your volume, the fluctuations are going to be like the square root of the number, okay? So this is the, this is the usual argument that if you're, if you're measuring, I don't know, if you, if you just, I mean, you can do this in one dimension, right? Pick random numbers al along one dimension, um, and then uh, let's pick, random, pick 100 random numbers between zero and one, um, and then uh, look in a small box, let's say between 0.1 and 0.2. On average, you should find 10, but you'll find uh, that the fluctuations are of order three, okay? But you realize that since the count is related to the concentration, if I asked you, if you count n molecules, and I ask you, what is your estimate of the concentration? What you would say is just take your count and divide by the volume. That's what you mean by concentration. So in particular, what that means is that since the fluctuations in concentration go like one over the square root, right? The fractional fluctuations, then this should also be your error in estimating the concentration. So what we say is that the error in est estimating the concentration goes like one over the square root of the average number, which is one over the square root of C times A cubed. But this is for one snapshot, right? I take one picture and I count. Now we all know that if things are noisy, you can improve your measurement by averaging over time. So what does that mean here? It means you don't just look at one instant in time, you look again, and then you look again, and you look again, and you look again, and you average over time. So if I average over time, what I should be able to do is improve my measurement so that it goes from what I started with to something which is smaller <clears throat> by the factor of the square root of the number of measurements. But how many measurements did I make? Well, you could say, look, you're, you're measuring continuously in time, so you make an infinite number of measurements. But that's not right, because the measurements have to be independent of each other. So I really care about the number of independent measurements. And that's the amount of time that I'm willing to average over divided by some characteristic time or correlation time, which is how long it takes to, so that I'm looking at new molecules, right? If the molecules haven't moved and I count them again, I don't learn anything new about the concentration in the outside world. I have to wait for the molecules that are in my little volume to exchange with the outside world. And how long does that take? Well, the molecules are diffusing. So if they are diffusing with some diffusion constant tau, so diffusion constant D, and they diffuse for the correlation time, that should be enough time to clear out the volume, which is of linear dimensions A. So that tells me that my characteristic time is A squared over B. So now this is the part where it would be nice if we had, you know, the blackboard sliding up and down. So let me copy things over. We said that the result was going to be the one over the square root of the number of molecules that I count and one over the square root of the number of measurements. And the number of measurements is the averaging time div divided by the correlation time, but the correlation time is the size of my detector squared divided by the diffusion constant. So if you put all of these factors together, you get this beautiful formula that was derived by Berg and Purcell. <clears throat> 
which is this. So put all of these things together and you get that. So the fractional error that you make in estimating a concentration is one over the square root of something. And that something is how long you're willing to measure, how many molecules there are, how big your detector is, and how fast the molecules are diffusing. And in fact, there's a very simple way of thinking about this, which is that you're sitting there as a detector and the molecules are coming at you. And what you're doing is counting them as they arrive. Um, yes. Uh, Let me emphasize that this is a rough argument. This is precise. This is the problem with the Bergen Purcell paper, but it's also part of the beauty is that it's very intuitive, but then you, you worry about whether you left anything out. So let me, the, the question of whether we left anything out, you know, you can do that for hours. So let me be sure that everybody gets the right intuition. And um, if you want to delve into the literature, you're welcome. But it turns out this intuition really is correct, which, which is kind of, which is very pretty. So um, it's a rough argument. So, and we're going to use it in a rough way, so it'll be okay. So one way to think about this is that the molecules are arriving at your detector, and they're arriving by diffusion. So if you're a volume of linear dimension A, and I ask you, how fast do molecules arrive at the surface of your detector by diffusion? The answer is, again, up to, up to constant factors. It's proportional to the diffusion constant, the size of the detector, and the concentration. So what's happening is the molecules are arriving at this rate, dAc, and they're arriving as a random process. So in a time tau average, this is how many new molecules arrive that you can count. And so that's the n whose, for which square root of n determines your position. It's just, by the way, like counting photons, right? In a normal light source, the photons are also arriving at random at your detector. And so the precision which you can measure the intensity is one over the square root of the number of, of, number of photons that you count. And by the way, your visual system can actually reach a precision of measuring intensity, which is close to the limit that's set by counting photons, at least when it's dark outside. So, so this is the Bird Purcell limit. And as I say, it's, you know, it's approximate, but it's enough to give you, um, give you the idea. So, um, uh, so we're having this discussion. We're, let's, um, the question that was asked is, is whether um, uh, you have to think about each cell sort of making its decisions on its own or whether they can compare with their neighbors and improve things. Um, that's a really interesting question, which I'd like to put off. Um, we know that a certain amount of comparison happens, um, but, uh, um, but let me, let me leave the, pro let's, let's talk about the problem as it was happening in a single cell. Um, so uh, the, to think about the time. Um, so the most important thing we can do right now is to plug in numbers. So what is the concentration of um, the molecules that we care about? So these are transcription factor molecules. And, and we know about the concentration. For, right? Transcription factor molecules act by binding to DNA. So what matters is what's the concentration when about half of the sites are bound? And we know that that concentration is measured in nanomolar. There's a lot of experiments that show that that's true. Could be one nanomolar, could be 10 nanomolar. It's not 1,000 nanomolar. It might be 50, OK? But it's measured in nanomolar. Nanomolar is a, complete, is a unit very much beloved of chemists. Um, it is. Uh, Ah, somebody asked about the question of, of, of uh, how do you average over time. Um, 
because you're doing everything by making and degrading molecules, averaging over time is easy. Just make molecules. So when molecules arrive at their target, it causes something to happen. And the something is ultimately that molecules get synthesized. Messenger RNA molecules get made, protein molecules get made. Just let them accumulate and you've averaged over time. So in some sense, it's easier to integrate than to not integrate over time. The hard thing to do is to, is to be sensitive to something that happens very fast. It's much easier to be, to be sensitive to the average over a long period of time. Um, so concentrations are measured in nanomolar. Uh, and you know, if you think back to your high school chemistry course, you know that a molar means one mole of stuff in one liter volume. Um, and there aren't, there's never a mole of these molecules. And certainly liters aren't relevant. So um, it's important to know that that concentration corresponds to 0.6 molecules per cubic micron, which for our purposes is about one molecule per cubic micron. If I ask you about the diffusion constant of proteins in a cell, the answer is it's measured in microns squared per second. Okay, again, could be 0.3, it could be four, something like that. What about the size of the detector? Well, it's the place where the molecule binds, right? And that has to be of this order of the size of the molecule itself. It's you know, something like seven base pairs of DNA is where this particular protein sticks. And so it's maybe three nanometers, so three times 10 to the minus three microns. Hi, Bill, sorry to interrupt. Are we supposed yeah. to be seeing you right this yes, right. we are. And you're not, but maybe. Great. Okay. Maybe you're here. Okay. Um, yeah, I have no idea about that, why that happens. Um, so, if you put these things together, you see that D times A times C, right? Conveniently, the microns all cancel, and you get three times ten to the minus three per second, which is about one over three hundred seconds. So that means that the square root of D times A times C times your averaging time is roughly your averaging time divided by 300 seconds. Square root. So 300 seconds is five minutes. So what this tells you is that if you're measuring on the scale of minutes, tens of minutes and so on, then you're counting a few molecules, right? So get, <clears throat> in order to get to 10% accuracy, you have to count 100 molecules, right? Square root of 100 is 10. So that would suggest that you need to go for 500 minutes, which is way too long, right? 50 minutes is almost an hour, so this would be 10 hours, totally out of bounds. So you can put numbers here, and those numbers will take the, the, the 10 hours and push it down, maybe to an hour, maybe to half an hour. But in fact, a lot of these things happen on the five minute time scale because everything's happening so fast at these very early stages of development. So what this is telling you, I don't wanna, con I don't wanna claim, that I don't wanna leave you with the idea that we know for sure that the, um, that, the precision that the fly has in measuring concentration is exactly equal to the bird per cell limit. And in any case, the bird per cell limit is a kind of rough thing. We'd have to think harder to get all the numbers out in front. But what it tells you is that in order to make decisions about, in order to make positional distinctions with a 1% accuracy, it corresponds to making 10% judgments about concentration. And that given where the cell is operating, the time that it has available and the concentration of the molecules, that's on the right scale where the physical limit to how accurately you can measure concentrations isn't very far away. So the real embryo in deciding where to put boundaries is coming close to these limits. Okay. So that's the idea I wanted to leave you with. And um, Maybe what I can do, hmm, what I would love to do is, and what I had planned to do, is to talk about 
how to turn this observation that the scale on which embryos are making decisions is close to the limits that are imposed by, by very basic physical principles, just molecules diffusing around. How do you turn that around and turn it into an optimization principle and say, okay, if you believe that the real embryo is coming close to the limits, if I imagine these models for how these networks work, and I try to ask what values of the parameters would be consistent with performing close to this optimum. And maybe those are the parameters of the real system. So what I think I will try to do is sort of race through and give you a sense for how that argument works. And then we'll see um, whether tomorrow we should try to pick up a little bit more of that or switch completely. Um, so let me, um, so the question is essentially, what can you do in order to squeeze as much information as possible out of this very limited number of molecules that are arriving? So one idea is that when you build a, when you build a sensing device, that, that sensing device has some characteristics such that some signals are, are sensed more, sen or it's more sensitive to some things than others. And so you want to be sure that the input signals match the characteristics of the device that you're using. So what does this mean? It means that if you go back and think about that, those pictures that I drew of how the synthesis rate depends on the concentration of the transcription factor, you want to be sure that the actual values of the transcription factor concentrations are somehow in a region where the system is actually sensitive. And in fact, if you want to do more than that, there's a quantitative relationship that you should obey between the noise in the, the, noise in the measurement and the distribution of input concentration. So that's one kind of optimization. It's just saying, look, I don't know exactly how this thing works, but I better, I mean, it's the simple thing, right? It's very useful if the frequencies of sound that come out of my mouth are actually the frequencies your ear can hear, right? And we know, for instance, that if you look at different species of frogs, right, the, the frogs call at some frequency and the frogs have their best hearing at certain frequencies. And if you look across all the frogs, these are matched to each other. So there's some principle like that that should be working at the molecular level to be sure that the concentrations of the transcription factors are matched to the characteristics of the regulatory functions. And OK, that's a, that's a subject, right? You have, to, you have to figure out how to turn that into equations. There's another idea, which is you can tune the properties of the network itself. So for example, if you have one transcription factor that's turning on many genes, then you don't want them all to turn on at the same place, right? Because that doesn't give you any extra information. So what you could say is, well, if, I, if the different genes turn on at different concentrations, then by looking at the combination of these genes, is it on, you know, is this one on and this one is off, that tells me that the concentration, you know, if the purple one is on, it tells me the concentration must be above this level, but if all the others are off, that localizes me to this small region. And similarly, if I use more and more of these, I can get a finer and finer resolution along the concentration axis. But you'll notice that there's a certain amount of redundancy, right? If if the red one is on, you know that the purple one must also be on because they come in order. So one way to solve that is to have the um, uh, is to have these things turn each other off. And so then, in that case, if you look at the activity the, at the pro concentration of all these different proteins, they go up and down. And this is actually what happens in the network of both of these things are happening in the network that you see in the fly. Let me say that, that the idea of, of trying to design networks that, that extract as much information as possible from a limited number of molecules, um, this is something that we, the idea that we had more than a decade ago, and we thought that it would be a relatively easy problem. And what we did was we, we started with a warm up problem, which was this one, and that turned into a paper that I think is 14 pages long. Um, and it's taken us several more to actually understand the full structure of this problem. And only now are we able to put all the pieces together and try and design a whole network.
And so that's really the frontier of our understanding. Um, the last thing is that if you've gone to all this trouble to preserve the information and extract as much of it as possible, then you're going to use it to do something. And um, in, order, in order to use it, you have to kind of read it out. So you have to figure out if I see certain concentrations of all of these molecules at the level of those gap genes, how do I interpret that in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the position? So um, there's a very simple idea, right? Which is that you measure the concentrations of the proteins. And what you want to do is you want to infer your position. So what experiment can you do? The experiment you can do is to look at a particular position in many embryos and look at the concentration of all of those molecules. And it's not the same every time, so there's a probability distribution. So this is something you can get from experiment. But the thing you want to know is how to infer x. So this, inf this process of inference is that you're trying to determine the distribution of positions that are consistent with the concentrations. But many of you know the answer that you can find this by Bayes' rule. Right? So this is something that you measure. The distribution of positions is simple. It's one over the length of the embryo, right? Because you could be anywhere. And then this thing is just there for normalization. This thing is experimental. So if you believe me that our experimentalist friends really can measure this object, there's a lot to be discussed there if we had enough time, then I know how to build a model for how to infer the position. And this is all of the information that's available. So if the, if the fly is doing the right thing, it would really use this probability distribution. So let's try that idea. And what you see here is if you only had one of the genes, you wouldn't do very well. So what we've done here is you go to a particular position, you look up what the concentrations of these molecules are in the real embryo, and then you run it through the probability distribution that we saw before, and you infer the position, and what we show in grayscale is the probability distribution. So you're not surprised to learn, for instance, that if you only had access to this one molecule, if you saw a low concentration, then you know that you're either in the front or the back, but you don't really know very much. So there are these huge ambiguities, right? If you're a cell sitting here, maybe I can do this. If you're a cell sitting here, you actually don't know whether you're in the front half or the back half. You just know that you're not in the middle. And even if you're in the middle, right, you don't know whether you're on the rising edge or the trailing edge of this bump. If I give you a second gene to look at, the red one, I'm doing them in order here, then things get better. But what's amazing is that if you just do the, cal you just do the calculation, use all the information that's available, by the time you use all four genes, all the ambiguities are resolved. And if you look carefully, the width of this distribution is in fact 1%, which is the precision with which the cephalic furrow is formed and the position with which all of the stripes are formed. So how do we know whether we're right? Well, this is a fly. You can do genetics. So go all the way back to the mother and knock out one of the inputs to the system. If you knock out one of the inputs at the beginning, you change the shapes of the concentrations in that middle network. But if the fly is doing the calculation that we think it's doing, we can predict where every cell believes it should be. So what you find, for example, is if you knock out the thing that's, that's at the back end, then the probability distribution, instead of being a nice thin thing along the, along the, uh, the diagonal, it bends over like this. So what does this mean? It means that if you're a cell sitting here, instead of believing that you're at whatever this is, 0 0.7, uh, 0.76, of the way from the head to the tail. You believe instead that you're at a position uh, 0.68 or something like that from the head to the tail. But if you're posi at position 0.68, then one of those stripe patterns ought to have a peak because that's what happens in the normal fly. So then you go look at the mutant and you discover that there really is a peak there. 
And you can do this with several different pair rule genes. And you can ask, where is the peak in the mutant versus where it would be in the wild, in the normal fly, the wild type. And you see that they all run along the ridge of probability, just like they should. And in fact, you, you can do this for three different parable genes. You can do it for six different mutants. In each case, there are many stripes, and it all works. So what I hope this little sketch at least opened your eyes to is the idea that, that you can go from the comparison between real concentrations and the Berg Purcell limit that tell you that the fly is operating close to the physical limits. And you can turn that around and say, well, if the fly used all of the available information and extracted as much information as possible from this limited number of molecules, what would it do? I don't know how it does it, but what would it do? And that doesn't have any free parameters in it. So we've completely circumvented all of those 50 parameters. But we've been able to predict what happens when you manipulate the system by making mutations. And those predictions are successful. They're quantitative. You'll notice that the widths here, the width of this distribution is still of the order of a couple of percent. So we're making predictions with a couple of percent accuracy, which are correct, and they all work. But we've completely gotten away from worrying about parameters. So this is an illustration of this idea of how we, um, of how we can use the notion of optimization as a shortcut to cut through all of those very large number of parameters. So let me um, stop there. Um, I'm sorry I've run a little bit over. If people have patience, um, I can answer questions for a few minutes. And if not, um, we can, well, sorry. I will answer questions for a few minutes for those of you who have the energy. Um, and we can also, we will also begin tomorrow with 10 minutes or so um, uh, uh, with questions that are left over from today. And maybe what we should do is tomorrow, let's really start at 11. Um, so we can use the first five or 10 minutes for questions and still have uh, most of the day. So um, let's see what questions are here. How do you about reasoning? How do you go about reasoning about when a system is close to optimal? So um, I gave you an I'm, I've given you an example um, where uh, our suspicion was that the precision that you see might be close to some physical limit, and so that's one that we sort of put and, and then we decided to try using that as the lever to to, to develop optimization principles. I think what you want to do is, is you always want to have the thing you're going to use as an optimization principle be backed by some direct measurement that tells you that the system is close to optimal in a way that's relevant to the principle you're articulating. So you shouldn't just pick something at random. Even if it, so even if it sounds plausible, you might be wrong. So you want to, I mean, you could I mean, it's interesting to try out, right, just as a theoretical exercise. But I think one of the things that's, that's been exciting is that we can ground these ideas about optimization principles in direct measurements that show you that you're getting close to the optimum. And let me make another point, which is that that measurement that suggests that you're close to the optimum, you couldn't have made it 20 years ago. So in fact, what happened was that, that the theory which said, oh, there are these rough arguments about concentration. We sort of know something about concentrations of transcription factors, and we have all these rough numbers. If you put them together, you find that you're close to the Berg Purcell limit. So then part of what you want to do is go, is, is go find out whether, for example, the response of those genes in the middle layer to changes in the concentration of the top layer, is it really that precise, right? Is it really true that the system has 10% accuracy? And it does, okay? That didn't have to be true, right? It could have been that things are much noisier and somehow you make up for it somewhere else. Um, but instead it turns out that you really are close to the limit. And so thinking about the limits drove the development of new experimental techniques, obviously not by me alone, but um, uh, in collaboration with our experimental friends. So are there other 
Ah, do I want to comment about, about cancer? No, I don't know anything about cancer. Um, sorry. Uh, are there useful burkosolic loans in other contexts, something other? So um, photon counting is, is actually the original example. So the, the primordial example of a biological system coming close to physical limits is, is the ability of the visual system to count single photons um, on a dark night. Um, colleagues have thought about the problem of cells sensing their physical, their mechanical environment. Um, so what's the limit to your ability to sense, for instance, whether you're in a stiff environment or a floppy environment? We know that when you take cells from a stiff environment to a floppy environment, they do different things. Um, and this is actually important in different stages of development. It's also important for cancer, by the way, although I don't know very much about it. Um, uh, but because the environment is not a homogeneous thing, right? The environment of a cell involves lots of polymer, is a polymer network. And polymer networks have fluctuations in the concentration of all their components. There's a similar kind of argument about sensing your mechanical environment. That's another, that's another case. Um, is there a meta principle or you predict when the system be close to the optimal limit? Um, let me use this since we're at 110, let me use this as the last question. I, I, as you might guess, I find these arguments from optimization principles to be very attractive. I, they tell you that somehow behave, the way in which the real biological system is behaving can be tied back to some very fundamental physical considerations. And, and I think that, as I mentioned already just now, I think one of the things that this does is often drive the development of new experiments, new techniques, new kinds of analyses to test specifically the idea of optimization as opposed to predictions from an optimization theory. So trying to, trying to test directly whether the system is close to optimal performance or not. The, um, the question of which thing, you know, where should you look? Which things should you test? Um, how do I turn, um, and, and actually the, 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 the question that, that just came up is, you know, I'm telling you what optimum means in some context. And what is it that sets that context? Is there a, is there a sort of meta theory for optimization? So for example, what this, what this line of argument is saying is that it's very important to squeeze as much information as you can out of molecules that are present at very low concentrations. Well, wouldn't it be easier to just make more molecules and move the concentration up and then the whole problem is just easier? There are ideas about why you shouldn't do that, but I don't think we have an answer. And the answer isn't that molecules are expensive and you don't wanna to make too many of them because they're at very low concentration. So that can't really be the problem. There are many other molecules that are made. There, there's many more proteins you have to make other than the transcription factors and you have to make much more of those. So that's where your energy is going. Your energy is not going into making transcription factors. So there is a challenge in, in not turning the idea of optimization into another laundry list where you know, the system A is optimal for quantity one and system B is optimal for quantity two and system C is optimal for quantity three. And this relationship between which system and which quantity you should think about is somehow arbitrary. Um, I have ideas about how to do this in a more general way, but, but I think maybe it's better to leave you with the idea that there's a challenge in doing that rather than telling you my particular take on it. So let me stop there. Um, it's about 15 minutes over. I will try to be a little uh, better timed tomorrow. Um, and I will see you at 11. Um, and we will start the day with, as I say, let's start uh, precisely at, um, at 11. And we'll do, uh, we'll do um, five, 10 minutes of questions from today before we get started. And somebody asked um, about these characters behind me. Um, they are actually a lamp, um, as you can now see. Um, they're rats. Uh, they're made by a, a lighting designer who uh, passed away last year. His name was Ingo Maurer, a German designer, um, and who's basically a sculptor, made lots of beautiful objects. Um, 
in the original version, uh, they're not rats, they're people. And the, um, the piece was called Guantanamo. Um, and um, although I found it incredibly appealing, I didn't like the idea of having it in my house. Um, so it's a little disturbing. Uh, the rats are disturbing enough, um, but you know, this is New York City and there are lots of rats. So um, that's our part of our collection. So I will see you tomorrow at 11. Thanks. Thanks.